if you want to get back with your ex, you have to go through a phase of no contact in any type of situation. The problem with no contact is it requires a lot of resilience, a lot of energy, a lot of motivation, because it's very hard to feel that the person we love the most might never reach out or might never contact us. So that's what we will explore today, this fear that your ex will not contact you. I will explain how you can manage this fear. I will explain the mechanism, the psychological mechanism behind this fear and how to tackle it. And also the sort of practical ways for you to stay motivated, stay resilient and learn from this phase of no contact. Jingle. I get my ex back.com. Everyone deserves a second chance. As I said in the introduction, it is probably one of the most difficult uh, phase in people's life is when we have to deal with the breakup and we have to deal with this silence. We have to deal with the fact that we might not see that person. We might not hear from that person. And we create those scenarios, those stories in our head. They are gone forever. They're moved on. You know, if they don't contact me, it means that they forgot me, that they don't love me anymore, and it's over. The idea that nothing will be the same, nothing will be, I won't be able to reconnect, to re uh, sort of experience what we had together. This is the fear that you prob probably have right now. Obviously, not all relationships can be saved, and if you're not sure whether you have any chance of getting back with your ex, I would recommend you to take the quiz, which is totally free. But I've created this quiz so you get an idea, an insight on whether what I'm about to explain would apply and would work with you. Because if you have no chance of getting back with your ex, you can stay in no contact forever. It's not going to work. First of all, when we are anxious or when we are scared of uncertainty, we feel the gap. That's how our brain is wired. I mean, it's not necessarily when we're anxious, everybody does that. It's called sense making. It's when there's a gap in a story, we will always feel the gap. And the way we feel the gap is from our past experiences, from our traumas, from our childhood. And so if this goes in that trajectory, I assume that between this point and this point, there is like, this curve, okay? Or I project that after this point, then it will go there. But it might go there, it might go there, we don't know. I don't know if it's a good explanation. Let me know in the comment section. The idea of trajectory is a good one. If you see something, you know, a, you know, you, you throw a ball, and you have the expectation of where the ball would land. And I think sometimes in life, we expect that things will have a coherent trajectory. And sometimes, especially in relationship, <laughs> it's not necessarily uh, what would work. So, for instance, you would use your own ways of reading the story and think, and think like, if they ignore me, it means that they don't love me. If they don't reply, it means that they are dating someone. Okay? And there are many reasons why they don't talk to you, why they don't reply to your messages. We'll explore that at the end of the video, so bear with me till the end. So it's very important for you to understand that the way you read the story, the way you read the sign is completely subjective. And that's why people learn a lot and gain a lot having a therapist or a coach helping them is because we bring objectivity. We bring a sense of neutrality. We're not biased because we have feelings for that person. Another bias is the pattern recognition. The idea that we bring past experiences that are reinforced over time. For example, if you have had a boyfriend or a girlfriend who cheated on you in the past, or constantly having boyfriends, you are gonna assume that that person, that ex, is gonna reproduce the same thing. People always dump me, and that's why I'm reinforcing the idea, I'm reinforcing the thing that, ah, oh, yeah. I will push you, I will push that person to dump me. Financial <laughs> experts or financial advisors, they always have this caveat, and I think it applies as well in relationship to some extent. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. It's normal to expect that things will be the same. The problem or the, the thing that you have to be mindful is you have control of those things. Don't and that's what I, that's my job, that's what I 
excited about, that's what I love doing, is when I manage to help people to really understand that the way they read things is based on their insecurities. Those fears are based on insecurities, on anxiety. And by looking at them, by exploring them, by challenging them, you'll have a better sense of what's right, what's wrong, and you'll have a better sense of what you need to change. Because also, what happens in your thoughts will drive your actions. It's very important to deconstruct those things. And that's the value of no contact in my sense. It's not necessarily, to me, it's not a cunning plan to get your uh, ex to, to manipulate your ex or to get your ex to miss you. Yes, it does create this sort of feeling of loss. But I think for me, the no contact is mostly a tool for you to start that work, to start reflecting on your insecurities, and start addressing those things that you were not aware of probably. Uh, and I know a lot of people when they call me, it's like, I've learned so much and I'm grateful about your videos because I wish I'd do that before. And that's my, my purpose is really to share this to as many people as, as possible so they don't make the same mistake that I made, they don't make the same mistake that people um, would make if they don't know about attachment style, if they don't know about their insecurities and so on and so forth. And by the way, if you like this video, don't forget to like it and subscribe. That does help me a lot. What happens with a lot of people is when there is something uncertain, when they can't control the situation, they become anxious. So for example, people who are a bit avoidant like me, we have a uh, we are more adaptable and it's easier for us to deal with things that we can't control. We can accept that more easily. For people who are more in line with, I like to control things, I like to understand my environment, I like to know what I can expect, it's very hard because uncertainty will drive those stories, will, as we discussed before, create a lot of narratives in your head that you can't control. And if you look at some definitions of, of anxiety, it's basically when you obsess on some thoughts that you can't control. And because you can't control them, you can obsess indefinitely. And that's the problem with uh, this situation of no contact, is because you can't control your ex. And if you were in a relationship, you can't control your partner. So it's very hard, and if you think of it, and I think I would uh, challenge you to reflect maybe what were your controlling aspects during the relationship? What were you trying to get from your ex? What you were trying to get them to do for you, for example. And it's really based on how can I get my needs met? If you have an anxious attachment style, it's normal that we want to ensure that the person will meet our expectation and we will try to be sometimes manipulative because we want to get our needs met. And this is why I think it's very important for you to acknowledge that if you're anxious right now, if you have a hard time dealing with uncertainty, it's a sign. It's a sign that you should improve on this. And that has nothing to do with your ex, that has nothing to do with your relationship. Uh, but it has to say something to do with you and the way you trust other, the way you trust a relationship, the way you could perhaps build a more secure partnership with your next partner, whether it's your ex or with someone else. And so what is very important is to understand the, the concept of working model, so the way we see life, the way we see relationship. And trying to explore the insecure working model around control. So you perhaps have had inconsistent um, experience of, of your parents or caregivers who were inconsistent. That's how you basically create the foundation for someone to be more anxious as they grow up. And that creates a belief that you need to control the relationship dynamic, right? You need to be in charge because it's hard for you to let go. It's hard for you to give that space because you feel that if I do, I'm not going to get that consistency. And you've suffered from that lack of consistency. And so what you're trying to do with your partner is to control them. Okay. To be a kind of a, in a way, a, an emotional puppet. And so what you're doing is 
you avoid all those risks that are associated with attachment. So I would challenge you, and that's what we do in, in counseling, to really explore those working models because right now in the contact, because of the uncertainty, because of the lack of control, you are, you know, you are expressing those, in work, these, those working models really, really strongly. And this is why I think if it's painful and it's good, I'm, I took this concept and it's very interesting and I think it applies in many aspects uh, in, in your life. And actually this book is about creativity, it's not about relationship. It's the concept of resistance and the idea that when you feel a resistance, so something that opposes you, it's by going against that resistance, it's by understanding that if I resist, if I'm a bit scared, this is where you'll find your magic. This is where you'll find your creativity. So in the sense of the, the war of art, it's like whenever you're about to write something, whenever you're about to film yourself, if you feel it's hard, if you feel it's difficult, then it means that it, you'll probably get the maximum outcome. It's because it's difficult because it's something, perhaps it's new, perhaps you have the fear of failure and really accept that actually this resistance is a signal, not for you to give up, but actually to explore this. And I think 99% of people get it wrong is when there's something, when they feel resistance and it's normal because, and the reason 99% of people would do that is because uh, we have a sense of, safety, we have a sense of we will use the path that is the more enjoyable, the less painful. And so when we feel resistance, we associate it with pain, with danger. Whereas like actually it's the gate to some sort of uh, an improved version of yourself, some sort of fulfillment, uh, some sort of purpose-driven activities. Things that will have a lasting impact, things that if you look back in six months or 12 months, you'll think, okay, this is meaningful. Okay, watching Netflix in a, in a year's time, you wouldn't really pay attention. Doing this work, working on those things, having these big projects, for example, that are hard, that are difficult, that are scary. This is what matters. And that's what you're going through right now. This fear is actually a signal, right? And by doing that, you'll break those insecure working models. So I know it's painful, I know it's scary, I know it's daunting, but this is the key here. This is the signal for you to, okay, I don't want to be scared again. I want to overcome that fear. So therapy, counseling, find someone to help you. Could be me, could be Elizabeth, my business partner, could be anyone else that you find online. But it's really a signal that if you're scared right now, if you're freaking out during this no contact, probably not about your ex, probably not about the relationship, it's mainly about you and do this work. So here is how to read the situation from a, a secure point of view or an objective point of view. First of all, always remember what you had. Remember that relationship. Remember that your ex won't forget you because of what you had. If, it's, if he or she was in love with you and you had a strong, what I call life-defining relationship, they're not going to forget you if you don't talk to them for a month or two. That doesn't happen. You also have to accept, and I know it's very hard to accept, that you don't know what your ex is thinking. And I think there's this temptation of, I need to convince them, I need to discuss with them, I need to understand where they are so I can sort of shift their perception of things. Accept right now that you don't know what they think and you have to be okay with that. And explore, and that's the... Again, what I discussed a bit before, this urge of contacting your ex or perhaps your, your state of depression right now. Right now, maybe you are not motivated to go to work, you're tired or you're, you can't sleep. Use that pain, use this difficulty to guide your inner work of why is it so hard? What am I looking for? Um, are you looking to save the relationship? Are you looking to connect with someone? What are you losing? Why you took the, the decision to, to break up? There are so many questions around the relationship, around you that you should explore. And use this perhaps difficult time to do this, this work. 
usually I say very often is during the most difficult times in our life that we learn the most. And just to end on a positive note, you will get those answers. At some stage you will get those answers, usually way later than we want, but you will get those answers. If you, again, if you had like a strong relationship, you will be in touch with X at some stage for sure. 100% of the time. I'm not talking about getting back together. I'm talking about you will get those answers if you, that's the thing that, uh, you know, prevents you from sleeping at night. Now, I also believe that it's okay to reach out to your ex at some stage. At least after six weeks, it really depends on the length of the relationship. The idea of contacting your ex is not to get those answers, right? It's not to confront them. It's to wait whether it's to break the ice and let them come to you. That's it. And the recovery takes time. It takes as many times as you want. And sometimes it's actually better if it's longer because it means that you're building stronger foundations. You're not rushing things. And the end when you get those answers, they, sorry, they end with those answers. So, the questions that you want to ask your partner, the things that you want to share with your partner, you will be able to share those. But you have to wait the end of the recovery phase. So it's really step by step, slowly but surely, building up this intimacy and getting them to, to open up more to you. That was a long video. I hope you liked it. Don't hesitate to ping me on WhatsApp if you have any questions or want to discuss with me. I'll see you next time. Take care. Get up, nah, I ain't a quitter. Toss me the ball, I'm a really big hitter. Big picture, I'm a straight killer.